Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for, for, for hanging there with us uh, for Fashion Culture Futures virtual symposium all day. And here we are at the tail end, the amazing keynote conversation with the incredible and incomparable La Roche. Thank you so much for, for, for being here. It just warms my heart that, 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 that this is happening. And, yeah. you know, there's so many people that love you. I, I, I adore you and admire you and everything that you've done. And uh, I just hope, you know, I, my, my hope for this conversation that we'll have today, you know, that we get into your brain a little bit, into process, you know, and that's what I really kind of want to angle being that obviously Cooper Hewitt is the a design museum. We focus on process, focus mm -hmm. on building development, building blocks uh, 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 in creation. And so uh, we, we're just so excited for you to be here. But before I get into it, I'd love to read, you know, the bio for those who don't know, even though if they don't know, then they've been living under a rock, clearly. <laughs> but um, stylist and image architect La Roche undeniably transformed celebrities into fashion icons. Uh, La built his own network of brands and clients, which now include A-list celebrities such as Ndeya, uh, Carrie Washington, Anya Taylor-Joy, Naomi Osaka, Tom Holland, and many more. Some of Law's accomplishments include being the first African-American to be featured on the cover of the Hollywood uh, Reporter's Most Powerful Stylist Issue and joining the panel of judges for the hit TV show, America's Next Top Model. In 2019, Law acted as creative director for Tommy uh, and Zadea Fashion Line by Tommy Hilfiger, which premiered at Paris Fashion Week. In 2020, Law sat alongside Megan Stallion uh, uh, and others as a judge on HBO Max's voguing competition show, Legendary. And he will be, well, he already returned for the second season, which I saw, which I loved. And we're going to get into that just a little bit, not from, you know, an aesthetic point of view, but from your thought process on the show, because I'm very curious because you almost seem like the, Simon Cow esque of like the the bunch and you're in the critique that you give and the feedback that you give is hard for a purpose to empower and to better the each of the houses yeah. and so I think that that's something I also want to kind of get into uh, towards the end um, but fueled by his love for fashion law continues to conquer uh, cultural limitations making revolutionary strides for people of color within both the fashion and entertainment industry. So all out there, please give a warm round of applause for the incredible LaRoche. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say to all that. Thank you though. <laughs> I mean, you, there's nothing to say. You are, you are the GOAT, you're it. You know, when I think of you, you know, as a fashion historian, as an independent curator, as an educator, you know, I, I, I like to contextualize different people and, you know, not necessarily make equivalents, but uh, try to show some comparison similarities. And, you know, in my mind, there was back in the 18th century, there was Rose Bertin, who was uh, Marie Antoinette's uh, stylist and dressmaker, who created a lot of what we've seen and known of Marie Antoinette in terms of por portraiture mm -hmm. uh, and really kind of essentially styled the late 18th century. And mm -hmm. so for you, you have really uh, elevated what fashion is in, in the time that we've been living. And really for the last you know, 10, 15 years, it's been your essence. And, and I, I, I really want to kind of go back to a little bit of what we were talking about before of picking in your brain a little bit and uh, just looking at any creative project or looking at personally, maybe not necessarily working with a client, but any creative project, whether you're working with the brand, you know, what's a typical starting point for you when you're in a creative spirit? Um, it all, it starts always with um, brands, celebrities, whoever. It starts with research. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that and when I say we, I, I have a team behind me, so it's, it's not just me. Um, but we just want to make sure that we are fully informed on what it is um, that we're trying to do or what goals we are trying to accomplish. So if it's a, for example, if it's a new client, I actually had a conversation with a new, with a potential new client today. And she's asked me a very similar question. I was like, well, it all starts with research. So we go and we look at the client 
and we look at everything they've ever worn to every event they, they've ever gone to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and we take that and we dissect it into different subjects, like um, things that we love, that we thought were perfect, you know, that we wouldn't change a thing. And then things that were close to, close to being great, but there was that one thing that was, that was missing or wrong. And then things that we just didn't like at all. And not saying, oh, we didn't like that, but we look at it from a standpoint of, what could have been done to make this different? What could have made it better? How could we never make this mistake? Um, so it's, it's a lot of research and it's, it's really cerebral and it's, it's, it's really um, thought out. But, but we start there for, for everything. Right. And, and what about your childhood experiences? Is there anything back when you were in Chicago that you, mm-hmm. that, that kind of, uh, really kind of illuminating your mind that you like to kind of, the place that you like to go back to, mm-hmm. to really kind of nurture your creativity? Well, I think, I think my first fashion show was, was church, you know, mm-hmm. the, the black church and the women and, and a lot of the men as well in the black church, you know, that's where you went on Sunday and you yeah. saw, you know, the mothers of the church and the pastor's wife and the hats and the suits. And it was, it was, it was about all the bells and whistles. And I think me watching that and watching my grandmother um, prepare herself for church. And that started on Saturday night. Um, I was, I was always just fascinated with that, you know, and, um, and it was always something so glamorous about those women. And, you know, after, after that was when I was a young boy and as I, you know, grew older and moved through the world, I got different experiences. And, you know, right. when you get grown, then you see the girls in the clubs, you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> it's this fascination that I have with women. I think that really, um, fuels me to keep working because I just think that being a woman is an art form. Um, and sometimes it's a underappreciated art form, but for me, it's, it's the, it's everything to me, you know, it's women, you know, we're boys. We, well, I know I do it a little extra now, but you know, if I, you know, you just wake up, you brush your hair, take a shower and you off as opposed to women it's the hair, the nails, the undergarments, right. the makeup, you know what I mean? And it's, and the women who really, really love being women are mm-hmm. the ones that I just kind of like turn into a child over, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's that, it's that art form that, that has um, kept me creative these years. That's beautiful. I mean, it, it, your story is so familiar to so many, you know, from Andre Leon Talley, right? Whose grandmother was his, his first uh, muse or Patrick yeah. Kelly, whose grandmother also was, you know, his first muse, but both of them, their grandmothers were invested in the church. And that's where they saw fashion. And that speaks to a lot of uh, Black experiences and Black queer experiences specifically. Um, and, 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 and additionally, I, I'm also curious to know, you know, growing up as you were forming your own personal style mm-hmm. in order to inform what you would obviously, what you became, um, how, how did you see Chicago different specifically from other places? Um. I think I think regional regionally, um, mm-hmm. growing up black in a in a major metropolitan city, we all have things that we that we just grew up with, right? Um, and different brands, you know. When um, I was at I was coming into my adulthood around the time that um, everybody was really influenced by Little Kim and. Yeah. and Foxy Brown. And so it became, it went from like Nike and Reebok and to uh, I wanted Gucci and Versace, <laughs> you know? So mm-hmm. I'm right at the cusp when, when that thing, when that kind of thing exploded. Um, but yeah, I just think, I think, you know, being young and black and, you know, from a, 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 a um, kind of not prominent neighborhood, you know, you, clothes and fashion is a way to kind of build stature and status. Um, and so it was like certain things that we just had to have and you weren't, you weren't cool if you didn't have it. So, you know, um, but I think that's for us all over the country, right? And probably all over the world. It's like those trendy things that the, the cool kids at school are wearing that if you want to be a cool kid, you have to have it. So yeah, again, I went from, you know, sneakers and then I went into designer clothes really early 
I think mm-hmm. I started wearing designer. I think I got my first pair of Gucci shoes when I was 16. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it was like, you know, it was like, you feel, you know, it's just, hey. those have those, that way of just, again, giving you status in the black community. Right. Um, and you could have, you couldn't, I don't even know if I had a bed, but I had a pair of Gucci shoes, you know, because that, the, the, that dress and adornments is really so important to us as, you know, in our culture. So, okay. um, yeah, that, that's that story. I, and it's interesting that you say that because I feel like that essence, as you mentioned, is something that connects us across the country mm-hmm. and even the world. Um, and this is a quote, Kim Jenkins, I believe it's Kim Jenkins who said this earlier today. You know, we make our own fashion, whether it's braided hair, long nails, uh, and it's only when it's co-opted or appropriated on the runway that is considered fashionable rather than ghetto. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that that is something that you yourself, it, 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 you're really putting the hammer down on that uh, that trope that has historically continued, you know, because of our blackness, because of our skin color, not because yeah. of what we put out there. And this is something that I, I was thinking about when, when listening to that quote, you know, how important is credit to you, you know, when you have put out work and you see it copied or you see it, you know, transform or subverted into something else. Uh, how, how important is that to you? Do you feel flattered or do you feel, uh, enraged like what it what are those feelings I think it to me is it's a mixed emotion right mm-hmm. uh, part of me is part of me just as a black person in this in this country um, who studies and and is familiar on everything that we've been through you mm-hmm. know as a people feels like I just feel used to I just feel I mean it feels like everything was stolen to us from since we got here, you know, inventions and um, and vocabulary and dance and fashion. And so like, so it's almost that you feel so used to it in a way that it doesn't affect me, you know, that much anymore or ever really, because it's like, it's just the part. And it's, and I'm not saying that we should accept that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be offended and enraged, but it's also like, you almost expect it in a way, right? You expect things that that's going on in the hood to make it to the runway, and and they change the name and put it on a <laughs> put it on some another girl from another culture, and then it becomes, you know, chic. Um, you know, but I think I think one of my things in my profile is I say this all the time: she doesn't own chic, right? Mm-hmm. And we have to always remember that and, and be able to take our power back from the things that that are that is so us you know and because it's, it's like in, in my in, in my world it's like it's not chic until a white woman puts it on a white woman right so I always tell tell myself and say it to my sisters and when I get a chance to do things like this is to make everybody know that she doesn't own chic and when I say she I mean you know her over there with the blonde hair, blue eyes, right? right? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, that girl. But yeah, it's like, I, I do get, I, you know, I do get upset because it's like, we know where these things come from, right? We know where the baby hair comes from. Right. We wear, we know where the long nails and the gold teeth and the, yeah. the ring on every finger, we know where that comes from. And it's mm-hmm. like, I, I wouldn't, I don't really have a problem with other cultures you know, emulating us and doing doing things like us if they don't try to change it and, and act like they invented it. You know, right. French braids, cornrows, and then it was all of a sudden it was called boxer braids. And we like, no, it's, mm-hmm. it's no. not. It's, it's, <laughs> French, it's French braids, right? You know, you know what I mean? Like, just let it go. Just be like, hey, I saw this girl in Harlem and I love her hair and I asked her where mm-hmm. she got it done. And then I went and got my done because I loved it. Give right. us that instead of, you know, you know, one of those big hairstylists in fashion um doing something and really having their black assistants do it and then say they mm-hmm. did it and give it a new name and then it's like oh it's revolutionary we're like no we've been do- my mom used to do those baby hairs and i remember back in the um in the in the like late 80s they her, her friends used to call it cocaine lines you know what i mean because they'll do it and it's like you know what i mean so it was yeah. like you know we we know where the, the trends come from I, I don't think that's a secret to anyone 
Right. And in, in, in continuous to that, it, it's something also popped in my head. How, what are the feelings when you see another Black creator misappropriate or take something that is exclusive yours? Do you feel, you know, like it's, you know, for the community, for the culture, and that's what it's for? Or do you yeah. feel a sense of also ownership as an artist, you know, taking, you know, that race and, and culture and community aside? Do you feel a sense of ownership over your work? Um, no, I think my work, I think my work is for every, it's for us. You know, everything I do is led from being Black. Everything I do, everything I, I talk about, how I live my life, it's all from, from me knowing who I am as a black man. Um, so if it's us, no, I don't, I don't, I do it for us, right? I think a couple of years ago, my career just, I, I said it in an interview, I was like, my career is just not my career anymore, right? My career mm-hmm. is to inspire and motivate people who look like me who want to do this. Because when I was in high school or like, I didn't know this could exist for me. You know, right. I, I didn't know I can live in abundance and, and not live check to check and not, and be able to travel the world and have all these different experiences. So now everything I do and every um, mark I, I meet and every goal I, I do is not for me anymore. If, you know, if everything stopped for me right now, I had a hell of a career. I've had an amazing life. Um, so it's just, I, all my dreams, everything I dreamt has came true. So now I'm trying to teach myself how to dream bigger dreams and more dreams because every, when I started this career, everything that I dreamt about doing, I've done. So, so I give that to every, anybody and everybody who's watching me who have aspirations and goals to, to do things that I've done. So, so yeah, I have no ownership in my work anymore. You know, I'm not a designer yet. So that part of my creativity, I haven't really gotten a chance. No, those things I may take more ownership in, you know. But mm-hmm. but right now, my 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 what I'm doing now is it's not mine. Take it, you know. Especially mm-hmm. if it if it helps you or motivates you or um, gives you the feeling that that you can do it too. So I'm happy to share it. Right, and you you mentioned you said you're not a designer yet, but. Uh, you're a costume designer. I think that, yes. that, you know, so I think we need to touch on that a little bit in a minute. Um, but with, we also talked about surveillance at, you know, um, some at, at a program earlier today with some three incredible speakers. And, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about the topic. I, I'm curious to know, you know, again, back in your early uh, part of your career, you know, what did you learn about image creation and style development when you were working at the vintage boutique that you started out at? Yeah, um, I think that's, and I don't know how to say this and not sound not humble, but Go I ahead. think that's what, a little bit what I do different from a lot of other stylists. Like we work really hard to make it, tailor it to the individual. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Zendaya, would never, you know, I would never do the same things for that I do for her for another girl because it's just not, you know, it's like Carrie's not, Carrie Washington isn't Zendaya and Zendaya isn't Celine Dion and Celine Dion, you know what I mean? So we work really, really hard to build their aesthetic and not like, I don't really, I, I don't technically have an aesthetic. You know, you can look at some, um, some stylist and you know, they work right away because it's right. their aesthetic. So we work really hard to create and individualize that certain person's aesthetic. Um, and I, I did learn that at when I was at the vintage store because, you know, what it did was gave me experience of girls coming in and just trying on clothes, right? So I would I learned their nonverbal cues, right? I learned when a girl gets a dress on and she looks at herself, you know, what that looks like when she loves it. And I just carried that through. Uh, to what I'm doing now. So, but yeah, I I, I don't want to change anybody. I don't want to make anybody something. I want to just elevate them to the highest form of themselves. And I think um, that is what makes my work a little bit different, in my opinion. Right. And in, in speaking about how you took those verbal cues, you know, essentially you were people watching. 
mm-hmm. you know, you were looking at their behaviors and you were looking and, and you melt that in with all the behaviors that you were seeing out in your day to life, day to day life. And, you know, all the people that were around you. And I'm curious also to know, were there any like particular like characters uh, of people, of, of women that you were like, this is something that I always love to kind of draw into like this, this lady that is just burned in my brain, you know, yeah. that's there. Um, I think a lot of those women were in the church and my mom had, my mom was um, quite the character, but she had some friends that, that were um, really, really uh, dynamic. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah. She had a friend that used to, um, that was a car sales. Um, She sold Mercedes Benz's. So she was very kind of posh and really well dressed. And um, she just had this, 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 Cause this is like, this is the early nineties, right? Mm-hmm. So she was still probably, I didn't know, I can't say this for sure, but in my mind, she was still competing with a lot of men, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what she did and she was really successful at it. And she was always, and it was the tiny waist and it was the pencil skirt and it was the little wiggle. And, you know, it was just like, you know, it was just everything, I love it. <laughs> everything, you know, it was very, the Sandra Clark from 227 of it all. Yes. So it was like, my mom had a friend like that who used to dress like that. Um, yeah, so she, you know, thinking back to my childhood, that was one of the ones that I remember just when she, I used to love when she came over because I would watch, and they, they would, you know, smoke uh, Virginia Slim cigarettes and, you know, mm-hmm. drink martini or rye. And I just thought it was so fancy and- um, Legs so crossed and, so, and all. Yes, she was that, <laughs> she was that one. So, um, yeah. But there's been there's been many there have been many. Um, when I first moved to New York, it was a girl that used to get on the train with me, the L train, mm-hmm. and she used to wear these white pumps every day. Um, mm-hmm. So that was the first time that I ever had experienced daytime glamour. So she would be in full, and then she would wear these white pumps, and the white pumps had scuff marks and all that. But I thought it was so cool that it was purposeful, and it was on purpose that she wore those every day. Um, she, cause they looked lived in and, and those shoes just reminded me of New York and, mm-hmm. and they, they just scream New York, you know, I'm getting with this dress on and these white pumps and every morning, you know, and I just, um, I, I, I was so in, influenced by that, by that girl. I actually did a, a press tour with Zendaya, um, uh, for Spider-Man and mm-hmm. she wore a white pump with every single look. And so that was my homage back to that girl. And I wish I had met her and knew her and became friends with her. And, but yeah, she inspired that. So I, I keep those little mental notes and, and I replay them and I create stories based on them. I love that. And, and you know, e- even talking about creating stories, you know, you've used social media in just a, such an incredible way to reach people. And you, and, and I feel like you've thrive tremendously by way of social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And you've also used it to your own, you know, advantage to people watching as well, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 earlier today, Maude, uh, who was on that uh, surveillance talk, said social media apps have community guidelines and what, and she questioned what communities are they serving? And, you know, for, for younger creatives who are, you know, burgeoning or thinking about getting into a very similar adjacent field that you're uh, currently Mm -hmm. at the forefront, do you feel that social media is a democratic space enough for them to thrive today? Or do you feel it's too saturated? Do you feel that they should think uh, even more creative outside of that realm? No, I think, I think social media is is the place and will continue to be the place because you can be whoever you want to be. You can have as many um, titles in your profile as you want, as many, you know, mm-hmm. you, can, you can do and be whoever you want. And, and the beautiful part about that is made the world so small. Right. It's made the world tiny and everything seems in reach. Um, so I would, I, I would just encourage younger creatives to just figure out how to do it their way and to be, at, you know, as authentic as possible um, when they're doing that, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I love social media. I, I have a love and hate relationship with it because I'm obsessed. Um, but I do a lot of my research on, and things that you can see 
on Instagram were and learn on Instagram are things that you would have had to go to a library and right. pick up books or go to the magazine store and stand there until you get yelled at for reading all the magazines and not buying any, you know? So it's like, and that wasn't that far, that long ago, you know? So I think just the amount of knowledge that is just at your fingertips, I think, I think is a, that part of it is a really beautiful thing. If you can stay away from the toxic and, and, and all that, and just be laser focused and know why you're there, I think it's a beautiful tool. And into that, has your time on Legendary also served <laughs> as a great inspiration too? Because I've seen, Absolutely watched not. it and, and seeing you just enamored with what they obviously present yeah. um, and how they present it. Has that served as an inspiration to your cre creativity lately? Well, it always has. I think um, one of my first, outside of the church, when I, when I got old enough to go into the world, um, one of my first kind of like, just breathtaking moments um, with fashion happened at happened at a ball. Um, it was this this guy. His name is Thaddeus Allure, and he was this really kind of like thin, beautiful boy, like just beautiful, like beautiful skin and just super, just tiny and but long. And and I remember it was the labels category, and he walked out and he had on a pair of Gucci thongs, some type of probably Gucci stiletto and a Dior umbrella or something. It was just like, I had never saw anything like that. And I just, and you know, and I just, and for the labels category, they say what they're wearing it and, right. and all this. And it was just, I had, so I was just enamored with like, this is possible. Like you can do this, you know, it's like, it was a magazine come to life. And so that ballroom experience, I was, I've been going to balls for a really long time. And, um, but yeah, that that's another one of the things that was, you know, planted and planted into my brain, like, and that I reference sometimes and um, think about and and create from that. But yeah, the ball the ballroom scene has always been um, a big inspiration to me. And in general, the the labels category and there's a category uh, foot and eyewear when it's all about your shoe and your sunglasses and anything that had to the fashion categories was what I've always been, you know, in love with. Yeah. But I, I love and respect and, and so happy to be a part of Legendary because the ballroom community is, it's, it's one of those things that um, if you have never experienced that, you would never know that it's this, this interstate of these people and love and family um, that is just really incredible. What's been some, what's been a few of your favorite moments in that role as a judge and, and almost as a mentor, you know, mm -hmm. to them? I'm curious to know. Um, well, you know, what you see people, I wouldn't say there's two sides of me, but I am very quick wit and um, very blunt. Like I, I tend to say what I'm feeling, mm -hmm. um, but just legendary as a whole and, I love seeing the contestants and the houses that that have performed and competed go on to make money. <laughs> mm. You know what I mean? It's great. But if I love, I'm proud when I see, you know, the house of Lamban actually working with Lam Vaughn. You know what I mean? Oh. And I love when I see some of the people in Megan's video or I, yeah. you know, or see them teaching classes um, and, and taking it and, 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 and you know, helping it as a, using it as a tool to become more successful, and that's what I like. I love that we are shining this this huge light on on a community that's been you know underserved and um, forced to stay underground for such a long time. You know, so that part makes me the most proud, rather than just like a specific performance or you know costume and stuff. That it's it's the greater good of what the show has been able to afford some of the people that have been on it. Right. Amazing. And I have a few Q and A's that are like rolling in by the sure. number. Um, I have the first one here. What are your thoughts on the black women in luxury movement on social media? And do you think that this is an act of resistance? Are you familiar with the movement? I'm not, please. I, I, I'm not familiar that, that familiar either. I'm so sorry, but 
um, I, I, I assume that it's, you know, Black women, from, you know, amplifying themselves uh, and embracing luxury in a way that the fashion industry has not necessarily, um, that the fashion industry has not allowed them to be present in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess even in a broader sense, how do you feel, um, you know, because we talked about earlier, you know, how style is integral mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. us and, and yeah. we'll buy, you will spend a ton of money on, you know, luxury labels and, yeah. you know, that that is our part of our identity. But, you know, how do you feel about its promotion, I guess, on social media as an act of resistance? Um, I think... I mean, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm a firm believer that people should be able to do whatever they want to do. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's you, it's your page, your body, it's, you know, but I think, again, like we've all, as Black people, um, I think we've all always had an obsession with with luxury goods and, and fashion. Um, um, so that part, I, I, I don't think that's anything new. Um, and if I'm understanding the question, I the way I interpret it is that, you know, we are, as Black people, still wearing the logos and supporting these people that have for years have um, not appreciated it. Um, and, you know, that part, I, I don't know how to really speak on that because, you know, are you buying it because you love it or are you buying it because you want to be noticed by these, this group of people? So if it's the, if it's that you buy it just because you love it, because I had an aunt that, you know, every season she would get a new Airman scarf because she loved th- those scarves. She loved oh, going to get the little orange box and stacking it. You know what I mean? So it's like, she wasn't looking for validation or anything from anyone. She was doing it and she did it every season because she loved it. So I think that's what um, that's what we need to pay attention to and think about when we pose those type of questions. And uh, they hear in this next question, uh, they ask, how much influence do you law have on hairstyles uh, that accompany your clients' styles? Um, I, I, when looking at process, and I, I had a question about partnerships and collaborations, like who do you mm-hmm. bring into your team? And your it's wheels? my look. It is my look. No, just kidding. Um, but I'm not kidding. Um, I think as a stylist and, and when you work, when you work and you work with people, the type of people I work with who step out and the world sees them, the um, there's a theory in, in psychology that says the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and so I work with and, and influence everything, hair, makeup, nail color. Like it's, for me, it's a full, it's the full look because if, if the hair is, not quite right, then it throws the whole look off or the makeup. So, and I think that's why people like to work with me because I come in with a vision. And I sometimes when I have the authority to do so, I plug in the different people who I know can bring bring the vision to light because yeah, it's the, it's the whole look. It's not just the dress. Right. And some people love me for that. And some people don't like me as much for that, but wow. you know. <laughs> Maybe, but that that's the, but, but I, why wouldn't they? I mean, that it's great because for yeah, the- but we're, Everybody's a creative, right? And everybody wants their vision, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes their vision is just the vision for the hair or the vision for the makeup. So I come in and I make sure that the vision is complete, you know, the entire look. So, you know, but you also have to think that I work with some of the, the, the best creatives in the world, right? The, mm-hmm. you know, and so everybody has an opinion and sometimes, you know, people have egos and- um, you know, but it's, you know, it's for the greater good. So whatever. That's fair. I mean, there can be creative differences, but at the same time, I feel like you're the ringleader. Like your job <laughs> is to be the ringleader. Yeah, so yeah. you have to get the girls together. I feel the same way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> some of them might not feel that way, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, I do work with a lot of incredible people who, who do collaborate with me and who do understand my vision and, um, will let me lead, um, but you know, I, but I'm I'm thinking of it in a way that it's going to be great for everybody, you know. So, mm-hmm. and we all, and I always say this too. I'm like, will will we all be proud of that if we did it that way? So, yeah. Right. 
Um, here in this next question, it's a fun question. Mm -hmm. um, they want you to manifest a collaboration. I don't know if you want to say that out loud or not. I do want to say that out loud. Right. Um, I want to, I want to work with one of the the big store brands. I want to do something that can reach the masses, like a Target or a Walmart. Um, mm -hmm. I I love that. I love that. I love doing things where you create something that everybody could have a piece of you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I am manifesting that. I want, you know, Target or, you know, Walmart or what Macy's or some, something that, that I can touch the flyover states. I don't want to do something that feels too high end or too unattainable or, you know, not approachable. So I, I do have dreams of doing um, some type of collaboration with them and not even just clothes, but like home goods and, um, Everything is I'm I just got really, really into that during quarantine. I kind of uh, remodeled my house and I did all the um I did all the interiors on my own. So I was like, oh, okay, I can do that as well. So I would love that. And I would love to be able to, you know, pop in a Target or a Walmart and see people actually trying to close on it, buying the clothes and you know, talk to them and tell them, you know, I don't know. I just want and I want to do things that's really size inclusive and um, yeah, I, I just want to, I just want to be able to touch the masses with whatever that collaboration is. I love that. I love touching the masses because that's literally why we have the, the symposium as well as, um, you know, we curated the, the Willie Smith Street Culture Exhibition because Willie Smith, that was the core of his life was touching mm -hmm. the people and touching the masses. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing over $150 was his mantra. You know, he created patterns and designed patterns so that people who could even afford that could touch a bit of the yeah. Woodwear lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and so here we have another question. Uh, they say, hi, all. Uh, as a current fashion design student that wants to be a stylist but lives in a fashion drought, what advice do you have to get your foot in the door when it's hard to get clients? Um... I think, I think that what people should do is also take their time, right? I think if you have the opportunity to intern or work for someone whose work you admire or whose style you admire or whose trajectory you've been following and, and that's interesting to you, um, but take your time, right? Everybody wants to jump out and, and, and I'm saying this just from experience because I, I was one of those people who just jumped out <laughs> um, and decided that this is what I was going to do and I was going to move to LA without knowing anyone or ever really working in the industry. Um, but I made a lot of mistakes. I, laid a, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I lost a lot of money. I did a lot of things wrong, especially in regards to finance and taxes and, and all that. I, I, had to, I had no one to teach me that. So you know, I, tons and tons of mistakes, um, but also did it really, really quickly. Um, so I would say, take your time and, and really, really learn as much as you can about the business because putting the dress on the girl is the last part of it. You know, it's so many other things to, to, to that help that really is this business, you know, it's, it's the finances and it's invoicing and it's relationships and showrooms and designers. There's a lot. So if you get the opportunity to learn that from somebody else, um, then do so, uh, because I think it's, I think it's really beneficial. And I wish that I would have had the opportunity to assess someone or to intern for someone, um, because I just, I just, you know, trial and error is how I made it. But if you can not do it that way, then I think you shouldn't. That's so interesting because that's exactly, that was one of my questions uh, was how'd you learn your business savvy? Because I feel like you're so great at it. I mean, yeah. it's something that we as Black people is something uh, in the Black community that it's it's hard for many of us, yeah. you know, because we don't have, you know, many examples uh, to guide us and learn, you know, how, how to make investments or how to you know, uh, file your taxes or, yeah. you know, all of these different elements that are part of life and that help grow wealth. Um, yeah. Those things weren't afforded to many of us. And so, you know, that was, I thank you for being honest in your, mm -hmm. in, in your uh, response. Um, yeah. oh, I, um, 
so I don't really, at this point, I don't look at myself as a creative anymore. I look at myself as a business, as a brand. And I think that changing that perception, um, changing that perception is I think what helped me succeed. Like I don't, I'm still learning, right. I'm still learning about investments and I'm still learning um, trust and, and those type of things. Cause you know, from us, it's like, you put your money in your mattress, you know what I mean? You put it in a shoebox and put it in your closet. Um, and you, you know, and you don't tell nobody is there. So all of that coming from the way I was raised, um, I'm, I'm still learning, but I, I, my perception changed of who I am and what I am. Like I am a businessman first and foremost, I run a multi-million dollar global business at this point, And I run it like that. You know, I don't, I don't just think of myself as a creative who has great taste and, you know, has a great personality. No, I am, I am a business. Even when I'm on legendary, I am a business. I am a brand there as well. And I think when, when you, when you're able to to move from that perspective, mm-hmm. it changes things. Mm-hmm. And um, here we have another question. Uh, in, in even now that you have all of this knowledge, are you planning on teaching at yeah. a college or a university? Or is that like a dream that you have in the yeah. future? It, teaching and educating is definitely something that's happening really, really, really soon. Um, I'll, I'll be announcing something um, in the next few months that will give um, people a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more of me. So yeah, I, I think you know my thing is like when you learn, you teach. So everything that I've learned, I'm I'm really looking forward to teaching, teaching it all. But it'll it it's coming really soon. Thank you for that question, actually. So students need to be on the lookout to see whose course schedule is about to be uh, <laughs> lit for the yes. upcoming when I think as Black people, when we learn, we have to teach. We have yeah. to. Absolutely. Um, we have another question, particularly around process. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you feel about virtual styling? And do you think it takes away from the essence of the relationship between stylists and their muse? Well, I think it's it's the new normal. It, well, for the last year, it's, everything was virtual. and um, you know, as, as people, we figure it out. That's part of, um, I think, the strength of, of just being human. You know, when you're faced with some type of adversity, you have to pivot. You know, you just, you have to. And um, my my business was able to sustain um, and grow during in the pandemic based on my ability to pivot. So although, yes, I want to be there to zip the dress up and to be in a fitting and to make suggestions and feel that energy and 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 share the excitement, but we we you know we do what we must do, um, and I think that being safe and and making sure everybody else around you was safe was the most important thing. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just clothes, and those days will come again. And when they do, you know, I'm happy to be there on the red carpet and in the fittings and and all that. And it's changing, it's opening up, and we're doing more things um, in person now. And but you know it. You got to, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. I mean, <laughs> look, it's just the time. And keep a smile right. on your face and be grateful. Attitude of gratitude and just be like, I may not be in the room, but I'm still working. So, exactly. you know. And yeah. I feel like you're, you can be in 15 different places at once too, right? Do you feel like you can do more, even more work virtually? You know, I can be in 15 would? places at once anyway, though. <laughs> Period. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always felt like I could do that anyway, you know, like okay. double book, triple book. But yeah, you know, you figure it out. Hey. And that's also one of the joys of, of I think, my business and, and me is that I've just been able to figure it out, you know, mm-hmm. and you just keep figuring it out and um, yeah, and keep moving. Did you have to virtually, well, when you were costume designing for Malcolm and Marie, did you have to? All virtual. Virtual. Mm-hmm. What was that like? What was that um, process? Like? That was really interesting. But um, Sam Levison, the director that I filmed, was very um, informal, right? He would just call me at one o'clock in the morning. It's like, oh, I had some ideas, and and we would talk and and we just send things back and forth. But yeah, I did all that. I was in Chicago. The dress was made in New York, and they were. I'm not. I was in LA. I'm sorry. And they had a closed set, a very small, small crew for that film. Um, like three hours, four hours from LA. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't get to see or touch anything. It was all FaceTime. 
did it all on FaceTime. Incredible. Well, mm-hmm. the pro- well, what came out of it was absolutely yeah. timeless. Um, so congratulations. And another congratulations comes from uh, another uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, what was it like being recognized and featured on the cover of The Hollywood Reporter for your work? And did you actually walk in those heels? I, there's a video on my page. Absolutely. We can pop in a heel. <laughs> we definitely can pop in a heel. Um, um, that, was, that was really special to me because I've been on that list a few times. And um, the way that, the way I feel like they celebrated me this time and, and named me as the number one, um, the number one stylist, um, and that's all in context, right? But I think it was just a beautiful, beautiful way. And I felt like myself and authentic. And, you know, and I, I think I held my own next to two extremely beautiful women, um, mm-hmm. Zendaya and Anya Taylor-Joy. Um, I, I just felt so special that day. And I, I really felt celebrated. And, um, and I also just, you know, it's this spot. It's when I was in the airport or... You know, I was in New York and, and a couple of people saw me and just like, you just inspire me so much. I think that's that's why we do it. That's why we work so hard so that we know that we have this sense of um, this sense of pride. And also that if 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 I can, you can. Right. It's because, you know, representation really means a lot. It's like if, if I can do it and I can have these successes and you see me and I look like you then you know you can do it too. And I, I that brings me the most joy than, you know, than anything else. Um, I, I remember this this kid said to me, he was like, I know I can because you did. And that was just so, 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 so powerful to me, those those few words. So yeah, I I, I appreciate it, but you know, it's a, it's a moment and I, I need to have more moments. Um, so I'm working to have better and bigger and greater moments that I can leave a legacy of, you know, opening doors for people and inspiring people and um, and being aspirational as well. Right. Um, and we have another question um, who said, thank you so much for this. Um, and they were wondering, where do you go for inspiration to recharge, you know, for your creative juices, I guess, to, to start from scratch sometimes? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm really kind of insane in that way. I, you know, I wake up every day as a new day. So I, f- I always feel recharged and I, 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 and I still actually love my job and I love what I do. So, you know, every time I get a phone call, whether it's a new client, somebody who wants to work with me, I still get really flattered. Um, and I, you know, get nervous and butterflies. I'm like, what if I don't do a good job? So it all mm-hmm. still feels very new to me. So I, I'm still, um, cause I've only, I've been, playing around with it for 10 years, but I've only been in LA and actually working for seven. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, I'm still happy and, and I, it brings me joy. So, so I'm, I'm ready, you know, and I'm, I'm dressing right now. I think I have 13 clients and, um, you know, and everybody's working and I'm dressing the biggest, you know, s- s- most powerful, you know, most creative, most beautiful people in the world. And, you know, and, and we just, we keep it moving. And um, yeah, I'm all, I just feel like I'm already always charged, but I, I might be a little crazy too. So we don't know. <laughs> we don't know that for sure or not, but yeah, I, I'm, I just wake up every day. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new opportunity to do something great. And, and in that we have another question, you know, how do you see your practice changing as we move into the future? You know, um, right now, you know, I think you you probably have a good system. You have a, a system that's worked for you, or that mm-hmm. you formed and that you formulated that we've discussed. But do you see it changing and evolving? Um. Yeah. I think. I think I will. I think the education is going to be a big part of it, and I think also moving into being a designer. I think it's the natural transition from a stylist. You. You. Um. And if I can figure out that and and know for sure who my girl is and what excuse me, what I want my aesthetic to be and and where I want my clothes to sit. I think that will happen. It's coming. It's coming. I don't think that I'll be um a stylist doing day-to-day stuff um for that much longer. Um mm-hmm. because I also also want to elevate. I think me selling vintage in a vintage store was my kind of breakthrough um 
into fashion. And then I took that and everything I learned then I moved over to becoming a stylist. And I think the, again, the natural transition is to go into design and, um, yeah, and I think I'll be doing that, you know, for a while. And hopefully I can create some success um, when I choose to go that way. And, you know, I'll do that for, a, you know, a few years and then we'll figure something else out. I just want to keep, you know, trying things within the realm of, of course, fashion and style. And because um, right. I think that's where my God given talent is. I don't I can't do anything else. I can't really dance. I don't sing, you know, cooking is OK. You know what I mean? It was like mm -hmm. the, the talent. The, I feel like that that God gave me um, is in that and making people feel special and beautiful and um, and and that feels good to me. So it'll be something in there, but um, styling. Well, I don't think I'll. I don't. Do, I won't do it that much longer. Right, and and for you, you're a storyteller, and that's yeah. how I, I, that's how I view you. And it's one last question. You know, for you. What is the definition of an image architect? Um, okay, so when I first came up with that name, it was just me being slick. You know, mm -hmm. me like, oh, everybody's a stylist. What makes me different? Yeah. But when I actually um, took on the name and trademarked the name, well, it was a little bit before I trademarked it, but I kind of start comparing what I did to an actual architect, right? Um, you know, like me getting a new client and, and going and doing all the research and finding out exactly who they are, or who they want to be. It's kind of like surveying the land, right? You go and you see right. what the thing that you're going to work on and, you know, and, and figure it out and, you know, test the soil and or whatever, you know. And then it's kind of like you take that and you build a plan for them. And that plan is a blueprint. You know, that's what architects do for me. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a blueprint, but it is a blueprint of, you know, who, where we want to take them and how we want to create and create this persona or, you know, this character or whatever. Um, and then you, and then they hire a contractor or, you know, work with a contractor. And then that's, you know, who's, who's going to do the windows and who's going to do the floors and the plumbing. And that's the same thing I do with, with hair and makeup and, and nail artists. And then also the designers, what dress, and then, you know, you take it from, the very beginning, all that you see it all the way through it to the end. That's what architect does. And I, instead of doing it for a building or a structure or a thing, I'm doing it for people and their images. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Law. I really appreciate this time we spent together. Of course, of course, my darling. I'm happy. Hi, Hi everyone out there. I can't see any of you, but um, <laughs> I appreciate you listening. I'm always, I'm always really, really flattered um, to do and happy to do things like this. Um, I just feel like and, and for our community, we have to, we, we have to touch each other and, and speak to each other and talk to each other. And, you know, I've, I've been really doing really well in my career and I don't want to ever feel like I'm not approachable or I'm not a, a phone call away or a DM or a text or introduction or this, you know, I want, I want to, I, I love being around my people. <laughs> I, I went to a party one time and they like, look at law out here with the people. I'm like, I am the people, baby. <laughs> I am still the people and I ain't going nowhere and I ain't trying to change. And, you know, I don't speak in proper English all the time. And I cut my sentences. I'm a Chicago boy, like for real, for real. And I, and I love it. And I love, 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 love being black. Love it. Amen. And I'm not changing nothing. No, it's a blessing. It it's is a blessing. blessing. It is a blessing. Well, in sum, I want to thank y'all out there um, for tuning in for Fashion Culture Futures, African-American Ingenuity, Activism, and Storytelling Virtual Symposium. It's the first one we've done here at Cooper Hughes Smithsonian Design Museum. And I want to thank all of the guests, the moderators, uh, and panelists uh, for joining us today, including Law. Thank you so much. This just made my entire year, my decade, century. It's everything. Um, and this is a, a permanent repository that we'll have here in the Smithsonian forever. So that, as I mentioned in the previous panel, so there's no place that someone can say that we didn't say it and that we didn't have these kind of conversations. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ruki, Secretary Bunch, uh, I want to also thank Alexandra Cunningham Cameron again, who I always forever be grateful for allowing me to come help curate the Willie Smith exhibition, as well as help her uh, uh, put the symposium together. Thank you so much to the education department, um, who's behind the scenes working and making all of this happen as well, and the communications department, every aspect that this 
uh, that this project has touched in Cooper Hewitt and across the Smithsonian, as well as our sister institution, the African American Museum, National Museum of African American Museum of History and Culture uh, down in DC. So thank y'all so much. We really appreciate this. Thank y'all. Thank you. Uh -huh.